Ayato Amajiri is an ugly simp with a sister complex who was so strong in his childhood that his own sister nerfed him by sealing his powers. Now years later, when his sister goes missing, Ayato transfers to his sister's old school where mysterious species known as Genestella fight with one another with their phenomenal physical qualities. Arriving at his new school, Ayato catches sight of a handkerchief which instantly activates his simp instincts. Realizing that the handkerchief fell from a room above, Ayato jumps on the window and finds the below mid Julie in her plot. Instead of cancelling Ayato on TikTok, Julie's challenges him to a duel. She tells Ayato that since he saw her holy thighs, he should now die. For the sake of his undeleted browsing history, Ayato puts up a good fight against Julie's. After dodging several of her attacks, Ayato actually manages to win against the princess. Once the duel comes to its end, the student council president, Claudia Enfield arrives and announces that by the power vested in her, she has invalidated the duel. Seeing Claudia with her superior talents, Julie's expresses her annoyance but decides to hold back on the roast battle. Later on, Claudia takes Ayato with her, informing him that they're in the same year so he may speak casually with her. Arriving at the office, Claudia formally welcomes Ayato to Seidoukan Academy. She states that as a broke nerd who managed to enroll in Seidoukan Academy, there is one thing that they all expect from him, and that is to win against the five prestigious schools of Asterisk. Continuing on, Claudia informs Ayato that a battle competition between the Genestella is held annually, but in recent years, their school has done poorly so she expects him to win at the Festa fighting tournaments. However, when Ayato expresses his lack of enthusiasm for tournaments, Claudia asks about his reason for being at Asterisk. Ayato responds with a question of his own, wondering if his older sister, Haruka, attended Seidoukan Academy. Claudia then presents the glitched remains of Haruka's records, revealing that she started attending five years ago but withdrew six months later due to personal issues, with only one file remaining. She adds that Haruka never participated in the festa or engaged in any duels for Seidoukan Academy rankings, raising doubts about her attendance. Showing Ayato a photo of an orgalux named Sir Veresta, Claudia mentions that there are no records of it being checked out and previous data from five years ago has been deleted, hinting that Haruka might have used it. She concludes that Haruka is likely no longer at Seidoukan Academy. Ayato quickly clarifies that he didn't come to Asterisk to search for Haruka but rather to find his own path. Later, Ayato arrives to his first class. There, he's greeted by Yabuki Aishiru, a useless side character that'll probably follow Ayato as his pathetic sidekick for the rest of the show. Of course, Yabuki informs Ayato that they'll be roomies. After class, Yabuki and Ayato come across Julie's in a buff twink in a tank top. Yabuki, being the gossip girl, tells Ayato that the ugly guy is Lester MacPhail who is one of the 12 high-ranking students along with Julie's. Since they're both featured on page 1 of the school magazine, they don't get along. Having said that, Yabuki also reveals that Julie's has kicked Lester's butt thrice in a row. As Lester demands a duel, Julie's tells him not to waste her time as she has something to accomplish. In a flashback, Ayato tells Haruka that his friends were telling him that they saw Haruka's only fans which prompted him to beat the living crap out of them. Haruka smiles and consoles Ayato that their father has forbidden him to fight because he's too much of a chat. Ayato becomes further distressed and asks Haruka when he can start fighting. In response, Haruka reassures him by explaining that he can use his powers once he discovers his purpose. While jogging, Ayato recalls the events of last night. Not wanting Julie's to get in trouble with Lester, Ayato inserts himself between them like a typical white knight. Lester's minions instantly recognize Ayato as the transfer student and try to pick a fight with him but quickly stop when they see Yabuki with his camera. Scared of 13-year-old Karens cancelling them online, Lester and his gang take off, leaving Ayato alone with Julie's. Curious of Julie's, Ayato asks her why she's fighting when she's a princess. Julie's reveals that she fights for money and expresses her determination to conquer the Phoenix Festa. Yabuki joins in by asking Julie's if she has a partner since the Phoenix is a tag team Festa. Julie's admits that while she is friendless she wants to partner up with a 64 Chad who makes six figures and can mew for hours. Realizing that the bar is too high for him, Yabuki runs off. In the meantime, Ayato requests Julie's to give him a tour of the academy and the town to which Julie's agrees. After his morning run, Ayato enters the class and greets Julie's. As she responds back, the entire class gasps in surprise. This upsets Julie's who tells the peasants to mind their business. A blue-haired girl sitting across from Ayato wakes up, revealing herself to be Sasami Asaya, 
Hayato's childhood friend whom he hasn't seen in about six years since she moved overseas. Hayato inquires about her father, Sasamiya Suichi, to which Sayer responds that her father sent her to Seidaukan Academy so she can promote his guns to depressed teens. Seeing Hayato interact with a flatboard lowly, Julie's becomes upset. After class, she tells Hayato that she's ready to show him around but Seiya protests that she will gladly be Hayato's guide. As the two girls fight over Ayato's white sauce, Claudia comes and shuts them down by pushing her big plots on Ayato. She informs Ayato that tomorrow she'll have him to herself and leaves the washboards burning with anger. In the end, both Julie's and Seiya decide to show Ayato around. However, once Ayato leaves to get them drinks, Seiya learns that Julie's fought against Ayato. She tells Julie's that while she's strong, she's nowhere as strong as Ayato. Right then, two hooded men direct an attack towards them. Seiya, quick on her toes, pulls out a grenade twice her size. Once Seiya nerfed the attackers, Julie's recognizes her strengths. The next day, Ayato inquires about the attack. Claudia reveals that due to lack of evidence, there isn't much to do. Inside the testing room, Claudia explains the procedure of choosing a weapon. If an applicant manages to score 80%, or above, then the Seidaukan equipment team will consider the applicant compatible with the weapon. Understanding the procedure, Ayato observes Lester going for Sir Veresta but as he activates the weapon, Ayato experiences a weird sensation. Seeing Lester struggle with the blade, Claudia reveals that Sir Veresta has a will of its own. Once Lester is overthrown, Sir Veresta aims for Ayato who manages to wield the rude blade. Impressed by Ayato's performance, Claudia invites him to her room. Seeing Claudia without her plot armor, Ayato begins to glitch like a broken track record. He takes a look around her room and tells Claudia that she certainly has a big room. Claudia reveals that it's one of the benefits of being the top-ranking student. Finally getting on to business, Claudia informs Ayato that the students who had been selected for the Phoenix Festa have all withdrawn due to injuries. Ayato recalls how Julie's was previously attacked and realizes that someone is purposely targeting the students of Seidaukan Academy. Claudia tells him that she and the disciplinary committee have their bets on Lester and his henchmen, Randy since they're the only ones without an alibi. Furthermore, she requests Ayato to stay with Julie since she'll likely face another attack. Realizing that Claudia certainly has a lot on her plot, Ayato inquires why she's so concerned about Julie's. Claudia dodges the question by shoving her unprotected plots on Ayato's face, something that'll never happen to you. However, being a hardcore cherry boy, Ayato fumbles a baddie like Claudia and takes off. The next day, Ayato and Julie's travel around the town when Ayato expresses his concern and tells Julie's to lay low for a while. Julie's instantly cuts him off and states that she wouldn't cower against some pathetic losers. Defeated, Ayato gives her a small smile when all of a sudden, Lester and his goons appear to pick a fight with them. Ayato quickly tells Lester off which makes Julie's wet from the inside out. As Julie's and Ayato exit the restaurant, they stumble upon a group of Le Wolf Black students engaged in a fight. Julie's quickly discerns that it's a setup, recognizing the tactic where assailants feign a brawl to corner their target before attacking. She warns Ayato about the common ploy as the attackers close in on their intended victim. Fired up, Julie's quickly takes out the ugly hoodlum who reveals that a cloaked man gave him the directions to execute an attack on her. Right then, Julie's notices a hooded figure and rushes to catch him. Despite being strong, Ayato and Julie's fail to catch their true attackers. Later in her room, Julie's orders Ayato to take off his clothes. Thinking that Julie's totally wants his white sauce, Ayato backs off in fear. Julie's gets frustrated and reveals that she only wants to stitch up his clothes. While doing so, Ayato notices a picture of Julie's and her friends. Shocking, I know. Julie's confides in Ayato, disclosing that her friends are actually pathetic children from the orphanage. She explains that her motivation for being at Seidaukan Academy is to earn money to support the orphanage and provide for her friends. With bitterness in her voice, Julie's expresses her hatred for the Integrated Empire Foundation that assumed control over the world after the Inversia disaster. She tells Ayato that it's extremely foul of them to put students against each other for their sick pleasure. The following day, Julie's receives an anonymous letter, causing her to dismiss Ayato with a cold demeanor. Concerned, Ayato confides in Claudia about Julie's unusual reaction. Claudia suggests that the letter likely came from her attacker, and Julie's chose not to involve Ayato to shield him from harm. Upon hearing this, Ayato rushes after Julie's, realizing that his purpose is to protect her. Arriving at a rundown building, Julie's is greeted by Sila's Norman. 
he smirks and confidently tells Julies that if she withdraws from the Phoenix Festa, then he'll let her walk out of building alive. Right then, Lester arrive and learn his sidekick's antics. Julies tells Lester that it's highly possible that Silas is working with another academy. This upsets Lester who asks Silas why he'd betray his fellow students. Silas lets out a creepy laugh and informs Julies and Lester that everyone in Asterisk is essentially enemies, each pursuing their own selfish desires. Lester grows weary of Silas's nonsense and demands to know why he summoned him. Silas unveils his plan to shift the blame onto Lester. With a snap of his fingers, Silas summons his mechanical puppets, ready to battle against Lester and Julie's. As Lester finds himself overpowered and Julie's ends up getting captured, she tells Silas that she knows it's Alekans who's pulling his strings. After all, there's not one school that's capable of mass-producing mechanical puppets except for Alekant. Smirking, Silas tells Julie's that she's quite right and since she figured out the real perpetrator, he'll have to deal with her swiftly. Just as Julie's is on the verge of getting penetrated by a huge blade, Hayato bursts onto the scene, seizing his main protagonist moment by scooping Julie's off the ground and swiftly carrying her to safety. However, since Julie's is a strong independent woman, she gets upset at Hayato for coming to her rescue. With a grave expression, Ayato confides in Julie's, revealing that he has long been searching for his true purpose. Now, he realizes that what he truly wants to do is to protect her. As Silas and his puppet army arrive to ruin the moment, Ayato unleashes a power that has been sleeping inside of him. Like a chad, Ayato slays all the puppets without even dropping his queen. However, once the battle concludes, the shackles that had previously sealed Ayato's powers overwhelm him causing him to lose consciousness. In his subconscious, Ayato recollects a memory from the past when Haruka assures him that she will always protect him. She then proceeds to cast a binding spell to restrain his savage powers. After regaining his consciousness, Ayato tells Julie's that while his sister has her reasons, he'd like to know why she restrained his powers. A few days later, Claudia attends a joint meeting of student council presidents from different academies. However, right off the bat, the Wolf Black Academy's president, Dirk Eberween cusses out a fellow student council president who didn't appear in the meeting. Annoyed by the fat mouth breather, Gerard Worth Academy's president, Ernest raises his sword against him. Luckily, Fan Zinglu, president of Jai Long Academy manages to soothe the tense environment by telling the raging teens to quit their childishness. In the meantime, Ayato is seen rushing in the hallways when he collides with a girl that appears to be the perfect waifu for the fat jerk-offs out there. Even Ayato is caught lacking by her lowly frame and big plots. The girl named Kirin quickly takes off once an angry boomer yells her name. Ayato shakes off the encounter as he realizes that Julie's will surely whoop his unpunctual butt. Having partnered up for the Phoenix Festa, Ayato and Julie's challenge each other for a duel. Despite Julie's best attempt, Ayato manages to overwhelm her. Feeling upset at her inability to outwin Ayato, Julie's expresses her need to become stronger than ever. Ayato tells her to take it easy, reminding her that he doesn't know anyone more powerful than her. Unfortunately, Ayato's simp behavior doesn't earn him a guack guack as Julie's begins to inform Ayato about the formidable opponents they may encounter. She mentions that Gerard Worth's student council president, Ernest, is renowned as the Holy Knight due to his exceptional swordsmanship. Additionally, she notes that Jai Long's representative, Fan Zinglu, is famously referred to as the Beast of Epic Proportions. Ayato then reveals that he's heard of another formidable opponent, a girl who became the second person in history to triumph in Festus. Recognizing Ayato's reference, Julie's utters the name Ophelia with a tinge of bitterness. However, she quickly reassures Ayato that they hold an advantage since his skills remain unknown to others. Their conversation is cut short when Seiya and Lester arrive. Saya angrily tells Julie's that she has totally been enjoying Ayato's hot white sauce alone which isn't fair. As the two girls fuss over Ayato, the boys have a conversation of their own. Lester thanks Ayato for saving him from Sila's when Claudia appears with two ugly girls. Claudia introduces them as Alekant's students, revealing that Sadaokan and Alekant are joining hands for the creation of a new type of weapon. The overly energetic girl named Ernesta seizes the opportunity to shut Saya and Julie's by kissing Ayato on the cheek. Camilla, another elegant student, intervenes and apologizes for Ernest's actions, explaining that her father never returned with the milk. Camilla then taunts Saya for her choice of weapon, stating that it's outdated. This irks off Saya who tells Ayato that she's going to participate in the Phoenix Festa with him as her partner. Later on, Ayato comes across Kirin who is about to get slapped by her pathetic uncle. Being a nice guy, Ayato inserts his Pinocchio nose in their business and tells Kirin's uncle to not raise his hand against women. 
Kirin's uncle. Kuakairi retorts that he'll listen to him once he duels with Kirin. Accepting the challenge, Ayato battles with Kirin but due to the seal, he's unable to win against her. Julie's arrives and reprimands Ayato for battling against the school's number one. Later in the common room, Julie stiffly tells Ayato that had he not been a white knight, she would have been greatly disappointed at him. Ayato thanks Julie's but then asks her why she has been twitching like a creep. Julie's reveals that she's just upset that he lost to a 13-year-old girl. Upon hearing Kieran's age, Ayato gets a shock because clearly those plots are too huge for a 13-year-old. Noticing Ayato's interest in Kieran, Julie's tells him to calm his crimson mushroom and focus on pressing matters at hand. She reveals that at her current level, she can't seem to defeat him, Kirin, and Claudia, who happens to be ranked number two. This surprises Ayato, prompting Julie's to provide further information about Claudia's ability to see the future. However, what makes Kirin so special is that she's neither a strega nor does she wield a special weapon known as the Ogre Lux. Later, Ayato enters Claudia's office which basically consists of a giant swimming pool. Claudia informs Ayato that Kuakairu is notorious for causing trouble, and she also reveals that he's an employee of Seidouken Academy's parent company. She explains that he has been desperately trying to climb up the social ladder, which reveals why he has been forcing Kirin to duel. After having a talk with Claudia about the Integrated Empire Foundation, Ayato learns that only those who have shed their personal interests can become executives. He is then greeted by Kirin who thanks him for being her twink in shining armor. While walking together, Ayato remarks Kirin's swordsmanship, expressing interest in the Taudu style. He further inquiries Kirin about her reason for fighting. She reveals that she's trying to save her father and that's why she puts up with her pathetic uncle. The two part ways with the promise of training together. After seeing off Karin, Ayato gets bamboozled by Seiya who asks him about being partner with her. Having given his word to Julie's, Ayato declines Seiya who accepts the rejection like a champ. The next day, Ayato and Kirin go for a run when they are suddenly attacked by a bunch of overgrown lizards. As Ayato fails to defeat them, Kirin uses her Taudu style to slay the monsters. However, they are caught up in another accident as the ground beneath them breaks apart, causing Ayato and Kirin to fall in. As it turns out, the reason why Ayato and Kirin find themselves caught up in the mess so damn early in the morning is all thanks to Camilla and Ernesta who had been monitoring their movements. In the meantime, Kirin apologizes to Ayato for being a special needs child who doesn't know how to swim. Ayato consoles Kirin when suddenly they're greeted by a huge dragon. Using Sir Veresta, Ayato defeats the stinky lizard. However, the binding spell reacts, causing Ayato to scream in pain. Feeling the need to bond after a fight session, Ayato and Kirin remove their wet clothes. Kirin then learns that Ayato's timing in bed and battle are the same, lasting up to 5 minutes max. Curious about Kirin's motivations for joining Seidouken Academy, Ayato asks her why she's driven to fight. Kirin sadly discloses that she's fighting for her father, who was branded as a criminal. She explains how her father killed a man who had tried to harm her, and because he is a Genestella, he was imprisoned. Having no choice, Kirin had to turn to her uncle who told her that coming to Asterisk is the only way she can save her old man. After being rescued by the rescue team, Kirin finally gathers her courage to confront her uncle about his motives. Kuakairu brazenly reveals that he's only interested in the power she possesses as a Genestella. In that moment, Kuakairu also realizes that his pure niece is being rizzed by a creep teenage boy so he orders Kirin to stop hanging out with Ayato. However, when Kirin refuses, Kuakairu slaps her but despite the abuse, Kirin stands firm in her decision. After leaving her uncle gasping for air, Kirin challenges Ayato for a formal duel. Ayato accepts but tells Kirin that he can't lose the second time as he won't receive a guack guack from Julie's later. With everyone watching, Ayato successfully defeats Kirin who happily accepts defeat. Later, Kirin asks Ayato, Julie's and Seiya if she can join their practice sessions. Julie's try to refuse but Seiya welcomes her in the Ayato harem. The next day, Ayato hangs out with his harem and his sidekick, Yabuki when an ugly fangirl comes asking for an autograph. After giving her the autograph, Ayato is met with three furious girls. Yabuki being the ultimate sidekick, tells the girls to ease up as it's natural for Ayato to become a chick magnet after he took Kirin's spot as number one. The conversation changes as Ayato brings up the subject of Kirin and Seiya partnering up for the Phoenix Festa. Seiya tells him that she has to get back at Camilla for talking crap about her father's guns. On that note, Seiya informs Ayato that she and Kirin will not show up for training tomorrow as they need to socialize. 
The next day, Seiya and Kirin sit in an awkward silence as they realize that the only thing connecting them was their mutual love for Ayato's white sauce. Despite being an awkward loser, Seiya takes charge and invites Kirin for a shopping trip, revealing that she needs to buy a gift for her father. This saddens Kirin who is temporarily fatherless. Arriving at a shady place in town, Seiya casually walks in an illegal gun shop and buys a rare gun for her father's birthday. After completing her task, Seiya asks Kirin what she wants to do. Not having enough swimming experience, Kirin asks Seiya to help her learn how to swim. As the girls head to the communal pool, Kirin accidentally collides with an overconfident girl called Violet. At first she tries to challenge Kirin to a duel but upon recognizing her as a former number one, she tells her that she has explosive diarrhea. However, Seiya refuses to let Violet disrespect her partner so she agrees to duel with her. Within seconds, Seiya finishes off the pathetic loser and leaves to bond with Kirin. While relaxing, Seiya tells Kirin that she's a great person which fills Kirin with confidence, and the next day, the two lowlies find their partnership stronger than ever. The fat pig of La Wolf Black Academy enters an underground basement with an ugly girl named Corona. There, Dirk greets a mysterious girl in shackles and tells her to beat Iotto in the Phoenix Festa. The girl named Irene agrees but asks Dirk if he has kept his end of the bargain. While unlocking her shackles, Dirk assures Irene that he's a man of his words. The next day, all the contestants for the Phoenix Festa gather for the opening ceremony. An ugly boomer named Maidiath introduces himself as the chairman of the Festa Steering Committee. Julie's informs Iotto that Maidiath might look like a typical meat beater, but in truth he's an ex-student of Sadokan Academy who has won the Phoenix Festa. After the opening ceremony, Iotto tries to pull a Naruto move by asking Lester to join him for lunch. However, Lester being an ugly version of Sasuke, declines and tells Ayato that he's itching to fight him in the festa. Once Lester leaves, Ayato is once again bamboozled by Seiya. Kirin also arrives, revealing a bento. She shyly tells Ayato that she learned how to cook from Seiya and has made him food. After the meal, Ayato and his group learn about the nitty-gritty details of the match. To win against another team, the opposing side must destroy the school badges of their opponents. Alternatively, if a team loses consciousness or surrenders willingly, the judge will declare the other team as the winner. Finally the moment arrives as Ayato and Julie's face their very first opponent. Within seconds, Ayato destroys the opposing team leaving spectators in complete awe. Next up, Ernesta and Camilla face off against two high-ranking members of La Wolf. In a display of confidence, Ernesta gives her opponents a full minute to attack them. However, when they fail to do so, Ernesta and Camilla's robots effortlessly overpower their opponents. After witnessing the match, Seiya receives a call from her mad scientist of a father. He tells Seiya that he has sent her a new gun which she can use to ice guy depressed teens. While returning from a practice session, Julie's and Ayato discover a scuffle outside the arena. Upon further inspection, Julie's reveals to Ayato that the girl in skanky clothes is Irene, a page one in La Wolf Black. As Irene notices Ayato, she comes to challenge him to a duel when her sister, Priscilla arrives to reprimand her. It's easy to find out which one of the two sisters were raised with a father. After profusely apologizing to Ayato and Julie's, Priscilla drags her skanky sister away. Observing Irene's behavior towards Ayato, Julie's suspects that La Wolf must be plotting something evil. In the meantime, Seiya and Kirin face two pathetic side characters that we already know are about to get a whooping of a lifetime. After emerging victorious, Seiya and Kirin head to the shower when Ayato and Julie's arrive. Seiya happily greets Ayato in her birthday suit, revealing that she won. Five days later, Julie's and Ayato enter the arena for round two. This time, Ayato allows Julie's to take over the fight. After wrapping up the battle and securing a win for her team, Julie's and Ayato leave to eat lunch. While having a meal together, they watch Lester and Randy face Irene and Priscilla. During the fight, Irene bites down on Priscilla's neck, drawing blood. Julie's informs Ayato that Priscilla must be a regenerative who cannot only heal herself but also heal others. Then using her ogre Lux, Irene quickly overwhelms Lester, forcing him to surrender. Not having had the chance to shove her two plots on Ayato, Claudia seizes her moment and tries to tempt him. Luckily, Ayato gets a call from Kirin who informs him that Seiya is lost. Upon hearing that, Ayato leaves the dumb blonde bimbo and goes out in search of Seiya. While on his way, Ayato stumbles across Priscilla who happens to be running away from a group of roid-up men. Ayato quickly rescues her and learns that Irene was the one who stirred up trouble like always. Speaking of the devil, Irene comes charging towards Ayato. She tells Ayato to get away from Priscilla but before the two can duel, Priscilla reveals the entire story to Irene. Furious about the events that unfolded in her absence, Irene confronts Dirk. 
She asserts that when she's not present, it was his responsibility and the cat's duty to protect Priscilla. Once Irene leaves in anger, Dirk asks Corona to do a reading. After doing some voodoo shit, Corona reveals that she saw Irene and Priscilla's victory against Iotto and Julie's. In the meantime, Irene and Priscilla invite Iotto and Julie's for lunch as a token of appreciation. Irene then reveals that years ago, she borrowed a vast sum from Dirk and since then, the fat loser has been treating them worse than a pet brought from the deep web. Irene also informs the two that Dirk intends to have Iotto eliminated in tomorrow's match because he's afraid of Sir Verista. She explains to them how Dirk once witnessed someone using the same weapon. Iotto instantly realizes that Dirk must know something about his sister since she was the last wielder of Sir Verista. Later, Priscilla tries to vouch for Irene's character, revealing that her sister becomes a new person when she's wielding her ogre Lux, the Gravisheath. After parting ways with Julie's, Iotto visits Claudia who suddenly tries to kill him in a daze. Iotto quickly awakens Claudia from her trance before she could do him harm. Apologizing profusely, Claudia asks Iotto to team up with him in the Griffin Festa alongside Julie's. She then reveals that the luck she carries has an adverse effect, meaning she experiences her own death after falling asleep. Iotto then asks about the Gravisheath and learns that each Ogre Lux has its own personality. While some are good, others can be evil. As Julie's finds Iotto deep in his thoughts, she tells him that he doesn't need play Mr. Nice Guy with their opponents no matter what the circumstances. Iotto tells Julie's that he has a strategy in mind. Later, Julie's once again reminds Iotto that she has no intention of losing but they can try winning through his strategy. Arriving at the arena, Julie's and Iotto find themselves facing off against Irene and Priscilla. The match quickly intensifies as Sir Verista clashes with the dangerous Gravisheath. However, during the climax, Irene succumbs to the influence of the Gravisheath and attempts to drain all of Priscilla's blood. Sensing trouble, Iotto breaks the limiter on his powers and attempts to free Irene from her trance by shattering the Gravisheath. After succeeding, Iotto emerges victorious in the match but faints due to overexerting himself. Later, Iotto regains consciousness and makes up his mind to face the seal once and for all. What do you think guys? Will Iotto be able to break the seal on his savage powers on his own? Or will he find his sister, Haruka to help him out? Let us know down below and don't forget to subscribe if you want a waifu with big plots.